Hi, my name is Liz Riddiman and I am with Nine Health Fair and you know we come to you every week with our show Health Happens and you know we're talking about major health innovations that are happening all the time today because you know health is happening to you constantly and some of these innovations may have a big impact on you. Um, we're exploring in innovations that could in affect your health in the next few years or maybe even sooner. Um, either way, we're here to give you the information you need so you can be an educated health consumer. And I have my phone here, so please, we invite you to join the conversation. I'll be looking for your questions or comments. And joining me today is our Nine Health Fair President and CEO, Gary Drews. Gary, thanks for being here. I Good morning. Busy guy, so we always appreciate it when you can make time to join the show. Are you kidding? This is the fun part. <laughs> the fun part of the job, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, again, we invite you as we talk about all these different health innovations to join the conversation, share your thoughts, your concerns. Um, maybe you yourself have seen different innovations or heard, read about them and you know let us know about what's going on. Um, we are not medical professionals so we cannot recommend any of these innovations but um, you know it's still interesting to talk about and um, you know on that note Gary the future of medicine has always been kind of crazy and wild and you know you think of the MRI as one example of how that really just changed medicine as we know it. What makes this time in our history different? What a great question. So as a, as a CEO of a health-related organization, part of my role is to be looking out into the future a little bit to see what can impact our business, uh, what might impact our consumers, our customers. And so um, I've always had an interest in technology to some degree, but what's happening now really is a little bit different. If you go back in time, health innovation really is nothing new. You can go back to the 1800s and see how surgery evolved. You can see how, uh, you know, when the x-ray came along or penicillin came along. Those were... Anesthesia was a big one. Uh, that really changed. <laughs> yes, that would. Um, I'm, I'm sure patients appreciated that development. <laughs> and there are a lot of things like that of this magnitude that are happening. But what I'm kind of sensing is different this time. There's a, there's a convergence of different technologies all coming together and being developed at the same time now that is facilitating the kind of innovation that only those combination of things can develop. But the other part that's intersecting with this is the fact that we are all health consumers. And, um, you know, I worked a few years ago, I, I had the privilege of working at Connect for Health Colorado, which is Colorado's health insurance exchange. And what I, one of the things that I saw first and foremost at that place was just how important it is for us as consumers to understand what we're buying. And health insurance is not that easy to understand no. from the outside. Definitely not. <laughs> and so, you know, even some of the terminology and so on was, was pretty hard to understand. And what it helped me realize is that we are all now health consumers. Mm -hmm. We are shopping for health services in a way that we haven't. And so the, go the thing that goes along with all the technology that's developing is that the economic incentive to do so is also there now. And there's going to be a lot of fierce competition, too, from these companies to get these products out and to be the first and for it to be the best. And I would imagine that that's good for innovation. Well, it is. Competition it is alive and well in, <laughs> in health innovation, that's for sure. In fact, in, in Denver alone, which I'm, I'm pretty familiar with in terms of how healthcare innovation or health-related innovation has exploded, it's really been just in the last five years, since around 2012 or 13 when uh, organizations like Prime Health uh, started up. And it is an organization solely devoted to helping health startup companies get going. Do you think um, a huge part of that, you said, you know, mentioned five years ago that all of a sudden, you know, there's this, ma I guess, mass innovation. Do you think it has to do with this? Think, uh, Just a little bit. I, I had open here on my phone. I was, I'm always looking around to see what apps exist these days. And I've mentioned this one in the office, but there's uh, an app that, you know, one app that does your heart rate, your blood pressure, your emotions, um, a little dubious on that one, <laughs> um, uh, oxygen levels, and so on. So these things are happening simply because there's a sensor and a camera in our cell phones. That is facilitating an unbelievable amount of, uh, of new stuff. But imagine what's coming along five years from now that we can't even imagine. Right. Yeah. That economic incentive is a pretty powerful motivator to develop these things. Yeah. 
And so for those of you who are just joining us, we are talking about health innovations and how they may be impacting your life in the very near future. We'll see. Um, so we're going to go over a few innovations. We're going to talk about you know, what it is, give you an example, and how it may apply to us. And one thing I want to touch on is telemedicine. And I know you have a lot of stuff around that. And um, also, I just think it's very interesting um, in light of Hurricane Irma, I feel like this is pretty cool. Cigna now has expanded access to its 24-7 telephone helpline to provide personal assistance and support for all Florida residents. And Cigna and Cigna Health Spring have lifted the rest restriction on prescription refills, so no more like too soon to refill. If they need a refill, they're going to be able to get it. And so that's one um, current uh, example of how, you know, our technology and how... Um, health plans are helping people. Sure. Um, so telehealth is, is my favorite topic to talk about right now because it is happening now. And it is facilitating health to happen now. But it, what's unique about it is that it can happen anywhere, uh, almost anywhere in the world, at least where there's cell towers. And so uh, what's different about this, telehealth has been around for decades actually. Uh, I studied it in graduate, graduate school back in, you know, whenever that was. And uh, um, the thing is, the economic driver again, and access to care, the ability to see a doctor has changed over the course of time here. So uh, what telehealth does facilitate and why health insurance plans are now offering telehealth for 49 bucks and uh, all you do is turn on your phone, download the app, and you can dial up a doctor within minutes, literally. Uh, that is changing. Think about that for folks that are in rural areas that don't have access to a primary care doc or uh, uh, any other kind of specialist that's really taken up telehealth now. The, the evolution of this is changing partly because insurance companies are starting to reimburse mm -hmm. for telehealth. And novel, not, not so novel, but um, important uses like you just mentioned with the hurricane victims are coming about. So for instance, there's, there's, uh, you might have noticed that both Texas and Florida lifted the restriction um, during a state of emergency for a doctor to be able to support, an out-of-state doctor to be able to support patients in those states where there's a crisis happening. Well, this is kind of the first time that's been able to happen because of telehealth. And so there's, um, there's companies around here even. Hippo Health is one that's partnered with local docs in those states that are offering a free service to uh, flood victims right now. So I think that's a, a, a phenomenal uh, thing that's occurred just because of the technology that's existed and our ability to get the word out. Yep, yep. so again, for those of you who are just joining us, we are talking about health innovation and how it may be impacting you in the very near future. Um, and so joining me again is CEO Gary Drews. He's our CEO at Nine Health Fair. And so, yeah, you know, what about, I know you've got an example um, involving dermatology and all these ways that big data, robotics, artificial intelligence, and so on is impacting just dermatology. Why don't you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that? Oh, and again, you know, feel free to join the conversation. I want to invite Please. you to, yes, ask <laughs> questions. Um, we'll read your questions here and try to answer them. If we can't, we'll uh, do some research and get back to you. But join the conversation. Maybe you've seen some really innovative stuff lately. You know, share that with us. But, yeah. yeah, particularly around telehealth. I would love to know what your experience has been around telehealth. I used it um, recently. It didn't go that well. My wife used it. It went great. Um, sometimes I, I think it depends on all of us figuring out what does work with these mm -hmm. new technologies. Yeah. And so um, absolutely, the, um, uh, there's so many different aspects. You listed off a number of technologies that are all emerging. Uh, there happen to be nine, you know, yes. which is convenient because we are at Channel 9 right now and we are <laughs> yeah, called right. Nine Health and so on. So, um, but yeah, let's list these off for a minute because they are big terms and some of them you might have heard of, um, some of them you've been hearing about for decades, uh, such as robotics. Uh, but big data, for instance, is, uh, is a new thing and has come about and has allowed things like artificial intelligence to emerge. And um, one of the ones that um, I'm really interested in around dermatology is this idea of artificial intelligence. So there's a, a research study going on at, at Stanford right now 
that has developed a database of images, um, skin images of different kinds. And there's literally over 100,000, probably a couple hundred thousand now, images that the computer can look at mm -hmm. and determine, because there's such volume of data, determine which ones actually are cancerous okay. and which ones are not. Okay. And so they've been running tests on this at, at Stanford and determined that it has about uh, a 96% accuracy rate. Wow. Uh, for um, some of the tests they've been running. Now, of course, this is research and it's in progress, but what it's showing is that eventually the ability of that kind of a tool to show up on our, on our smartphones right. and us do our own skin screening mm -hmm. and then utilize the, the expert physician to help us figure out what to do. Right. So the diagnosis part is coming through more and more on, on technologies. Um, and that's going to push the, uh, the physicians in this case to work at a higher level to help us um, now know what to do with this diagnosis. Yes, yes. That's really exciting stuff. I mean, it's, it's in a way, I, I view it as, oh, you know, I can be a little more in control of my health. Yes. I like that. Well, you can. There are, there are tools coming about wildly fast. Yes, I and, like it. Uh, so let's talk about a couple others. Yeah, definitely. Um, I know we both we, um, did some research, and we have uh, a ton of examples here. And one that I found very interesting um, is about 3D printing. And you know we hear about 3D printing from time to time. And this one is a 3D printed tibia saves man's leg from amputation. This was in Australia. And it's believed to be the first of its kind. He had. I hope I'm pronouncing this right, osteomyelitis, elitis? Um, but it's a disease typically caused by bacteria, and it infected all of his tibia. And they were able to save his leg because of this 3D printed tibia. That's right. It's a pretty, <laughs> pretty wild thing. I wish we had the ability to, uh, well, you, you wouldn't want to see the pictures, but... Uh, <laughs> But yeah. it is remarkable to see what's happening on. In fact, I think just about every uh, body part, in, including um, bones, of course, as you mentioned, but other things are in development um, from organs to tissues, uh, even skin tissue. So dermatologists, again, are going to be able to 3D print tissue. And uh, so what's fascinating about this, uh, this story from Australia, it was a, I believe, a university that was pulling together this research and, um, and wrote a short paper of it. Uh, in fact, it showed up yesterday. They're from Queensland, Australia. And uh, they had the body part printed in another country, um, sending digitally the information. And uh, what's remarkable about this is how well it worked. Um, it did take like any first thing out of the gate. It took a number of surgeries and it took a long time to make this work. But what's happening is um, the idea of 3D printing uh, is taking hold and it's happening fast. So I'm kind of curious to, as you, one of our um, state's residents, a typical health consumer, how do you feel about uh, 3D printed body part being used in your body. Would, yeah. um, you know, we've had that happen now so far with, with non-3D printed things such mm -hmm. as joints, um, uh, you know, whether it's in toes or elbows or shoulders, you can replace a joint. But it's not 3D printed to your personal body and to your DNA and to best have, a, have the chance to, um, for your body to accept the technology. Right. So you know, what do you how, think? And how will it affect you? Do you think it will affect you? Um, and then also, if, if you're um, trying to ask questions, I'm sorry, my phone has froze up, and I can't see, seem to see anything. So I'm going to hopefully swap out with somebody else here whose phone might be working better than mine. And um, that see. way I can see if you have any questions. But yeah, again, for those of you just joining us, we are talking about health innovations and you know how they may be affecting you in the very near future and we've got a ton of examples here really good examples and um, what else do you got gary well you know one of the um, ones i mentioned artificial intelligence uh, earlier in terms of a uh, skin screening um, but art artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning both are kind of go hand in hand a little bit in terms of using big amounts of data to help uh, 
personalize medicine. So they are 3D printing drugs and uh, other components like this all the time. But what's also happening is the computers are able to analyze vast amounts of data mm -hmm. and come up very quickly in, in a matter of seconds, uh, in a lot of cases, things that can help us. So for instance, there are now um, devices that are for sale out on the market that can detect, for instance, uh, AFib, which is a heart arrhythmia. Um, it affects an extraordinary number of people around the world. And it's very hard to detect in a lot of cases. You may not even know it. In fact, this article um, just finished a study and suggested that over 35 million people worldwide unknowingly suffer from AFib. Well, AFib has a really high uh, correlation with stroke and heart failure. And so as an individual, as a consumer, right. I would love to know, OK, do I have it? One. Mm -hmm. um, Two, is this something I should be checking once in a while? Right. It's not a routine thing that um, might be discovered at a, at a physical um, with your doc or, or anywhere else. So if you have a tool, um, do you use it? Would you use it? Right. And so in this case, there is, uh, there's an app on my phone even that detects, theoretically detects AFib. And... Um, I think it's interesting because the um, Alive Core CEO says that over 35 million people around the world unknowingly suffer mm -hmm. from atrial fibrillation. That's right. And that's not one, I, I mean, I don't think, I, had, I don't hear a lot about that. No, and this had, this had a pretty high degree of success in, uh, in discovering undetected AFibs in mm -hmm. folks. There's, there's a lot of numbers here. If you're interested in the, in the short article, it's on uh, Moby Health News. Uh, which is one of these um, sources of health innovations that, that I uh, keep an eye on. Mm -hmm. There are a number of others like Medgadget, and um, many newsletters are now focused on what's being developed. And so I, I think this idea of artificial intelligence being able to diagnose things, but also then crowdsource solutions right. is a fascinating thing. Yeah, and that's, that's interesting too. I'd like to hear from you guys, um, what doesn't exist yet? that you think should exist. Mm -hmm. Is there something like, you know, I've always thought it'd be cool if you could just walk into a machine and it just scans your body and t tells you what's wrong with you. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked. Oh, so, um, <laughs> yeah, let me show you a picture of it. It's right here. Um, this is a, another newsletter that we follow called The Medical Futurist. Um, Dr. Bertalan Mesco is uh, from Europe and he seems to travel the world in discovery of these kinds of things. And he, um, one of the things he just wrote about this week, in fact, uh, is robotics. And so that's one of the nine technologies that you've been hearing about for years, that, that I have a robotic vacuum cleaner now. Oh, um, me too. I oh, love yeah, it. My yeah, father-in-law and father-in-law. It, it works, advice. but it gets stuck under the chair still. So there's some, there's some <laughs> work to be done around this. But the idea of robotics just in discovering what's going on with your body is happening. Um, of course, hospitals are using it for surgery now. There's robotic arms, there's, robotics, uh, there's robotic um, anesthesiologists, believe it or not. Interesting. Um, there is robotics in dermatology that uh, this machine scans you for uh, different kinds of lesions and it does basically a bodily inventory um, for your skin. Hmm. And so these kinds of things are evolving so fast uh, the question is, how do they come to market? Are they really evidence-based? Mm -hmm. Do they work? Um, and that's, it's still a little questionable uh, in that regard for some of this stuff. It's not all scientifically proven yet. Right. So another example we have here um, I, I'd love to talk about because I feel like cancer is something that affects most of us. I mean, either we know somebody who's had it or maybe you've um, experienced it yourself. And so now there is a new device that accurately identifies cancer in seconds. It's called the Mass Spec Pen, and this is from the University of Texas at Austin. And apparently it's a powerful tool that rapidly and accurately identifies cancerous tissue during surgery. And it can deliver results in 10 seconds. So yeah. that's pretty cool. And I get like what it's used for is like when they're cutting around to cut out the cancerous tissue, mm -hmm. um, it can help them more accurately make sure that they're getting the cancer, the, the, the tissue that is cancerous and not the tissue mm -hmm. that's not because it can also be bad to take out the 
right? Yeah. So yeah, you want to make sure you get it all. Um, right, yeah. And, you know, this, this stuff's pretty hard to see. So any technology that comes along that's able to detect differences in our cells mm -hmm. are, is going to be really helpful. Right. Um, one of the fascinating things that I, um, one of our nine uh, technology innovations that I'm most intrigued by are sensors. And so we all have sensors in our smartphones. In fact, it's right there. And if I put my finger on that sensor and touch the screen, it will uh, take my blood pressure and my pulse and a number of other things. That's all because sensors are evolving very quickly. And, and in fact, there's, uh, they're doing studies now. I don't believe they're on the market yet where they are actually injecting sensors into our body. Uh, into our bodies, and that sensor is able to detect in the bloodstream a tumor cell. And so this sensor is floating around in us all the time. It's kind of like a, a constant radar of saying, hey, wait, there's something harmful, harmful here. And uh, it alerts the computer, probably your smell, smartphone in the future, <laughs> yeah. uh, as to whether you're having, whether you have a tumor cell. So the evolution of this is, is just phenomenal. Um, some of the interesting things that are going to come around this are ethical questions right. and implementation and who gets what, but, uh, and how insurance companies may or may not reimburse for these right. things. So these are all big questions, but the technology has got to come first. And, uh, and that's driven by need, which is, you know, we're all clamoring for more information, for better health, we want to live longer, and Right. It's happening. It's the economic happening. incentive is there to develop these things. Yeah. All right, well, we are going to sign off here, but we will continue to monitor the feed. So, again, if you have any thoughts on innovations that you would like to see come about, share that with us. And if you've come across any interesting articles about you know, medical innovations, share those with us. We'd love to see that. And also, do not forget, our nine health fair season is approaching. We have our first fair September 23rd at Lamar Event Center, and there are more fairs uh, throughout the fall, so make sure you go to our website, nighthealthfair.org, and uh, find a fair near you. Absolutely, and I just want to put a plug in for volunteers. Yes. So uh, whether you know it or not, these health fairs are completely run by volunteers from your community, and both the medical volunteers and non-medical volunteers and especially phlebotomists. Um, they really are the source of the information for uh, what goes on at a health fair. So we need all three kinds of volunteers yes. at every fair. So we wanna, we wanna rally folks to come out and serve your community, help folks know their health, help them be able to start owning it like we're talking about every week here on this show. Mm -hmm. And uh, in advance, thanks for, for even thinking about volunteering. It all comes back to us as a community helping each other out. Yes, we appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon.